welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. If you are enjoying this podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software. Our listener support campaign continues. You can become one of our ongoing Patreon supporters for only $2 per month. As a Patreon supporter, you will receive a monthly update from me, along with the ability to vote for our our summer series for the Amazing World of Radio. And at the Shamus level of $4 or more per month, you will be able to access our premium site, without uh, dynamic inserted ads. You can become one of our Patreon supporters at patreon.greatdetectives.net. You can also mail in a donation to Adam Graham, P.O. Box 15913. That's P.O. Box 15913, Boise, Idaho, 83715. And I want to go ahead and thank John, Carolyn, and Robert for supporting the program that way. Thank you so much for your support. Now we're going to get into this week's Yours Truly Johnny Dollar Serial. We'll be presenting episodes one and two today and the concluding episodes on Friday. So you can obviously listen to them all together on Friday if you want. But the original air dates, April the 23rd and 24th, 1956. And this is The Lonely Hearts Matter, episodes one and two. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Dave Elwood, Johnny, Northwest Surety. Oh, hiya, Dave. How's the family? Oh, growing like weeds. You wouldn't even recognize I guess not. It's been a long time. Say, uh, you free at the moment, Johnny? Well, there's nothing going on here except the rent. What's on your mind? I don't know exactly. Maybe smoke, maybe a fire. I got a girl here in the office. You executives really live. Well, she's pretty enough to... Say, why don't you come on over here and meet her? Social, or do I get paid for it? You get paid. Uh Uh-huh. Jay Dollar, gigolo. Personal attention to Lonely Hearts. Special Lonely Hearts? Why'd you say that? Say what? Lonely Hearts. I don't know. Why? Is it a code of some kind? Well, you could call it that, I guess. What's it mean? Johnny, if this girl is telling the truth, it means murder. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office, Northwest Surety Company, Hartford, Connecticut... The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Lonely Hearts matter. Item one, a dollar and sixty cents. Taxi fare from my apartment to the Northwest Surety Building in the office of Dave Elwood, executive claims adjuster. A hard-working little man with thinning hair who, even after twenty years in the game, still couldn't help making every claim a personal matter. He met me in the outer office and led me off to one side. She's waiting inside there, Johnny. I wanted to brief you before you met her. Who is she, Dave? Her name is Norma Wells. She's from Chicago. She flew in from there this morning. Hasn't had any sleep, and she's pretty upset. Mm-hmm. What about her? Her father died three days ago. Suddenly, unexpectedly. What did he die of? Acute enteritis, supposedly. Well, the death certificate hasn't been signed yet. Is that what you meant by murder? Well, his daughter thinks so. Mm-hmm. Was he insured with you? $50,000, term life, written five months ago. Who was the beneficiary? This daughter? No, his wife. Uh, his second wife, that is. The girl's mother died years ago. Wells remarried a month before the policy was issued. A woman named Mabel Burke. The insurance is payable to her. And the Wells girl thinks she killed him. That's what she says. She's pretty mixed up. Why did she come here? And I'm not quite sure, Johnny. Suppose you ask her. Okay, let's go. This way. What about that lonely hearts crack you made on the phone? Well, that's how he met this new wife, this Mabel Burke, through a lonely hearts club. Like they say, marriage is a lottery. In this case, it sounds more like Russian roulette. Yeah. In here. Miss Wells, this is Johnny Dollar. He's a specialist, an expert in this kind of thing. I'm sure he'll be able to help you. How do you do, Mr. Mr. Dollar? Miss Wells. Now I'm going to leave you two alone. I have a couple of things i got to take care of. You just punch the intercom if you want me. Right, Dave. Thanks. Would you, uh... Would you care for a cigarette, Miss Wells? No, thank you. I... 
Yes, yes, I will, too. I... Oh, please forgive me. I I just can't seem to think straight. Oh, that's perfectly understandable. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Dollar. Sure. Forgive me for being so blunt, but when was the last time you had something to eat? Why, why yesterday morning, I, I guess. Uh-huh. Dave. Yes, Johnny? Suppose you could send out for a glass of orange juice, a hot roll, a pot of coffee? Oh, sure. I'll have one of the girls go get it. Good, thanks. No, no, please. I, I really couldn't. You're really going to, though. You're shaking so hard you can hardly hold on to that cigarette. I know. It's so stupid of me. You and your father were pretty close, I imagine. Yes. Until he married her. What kind of a woman is she? Well, she's strange. It's hard to explain. She's she's sort of vague. Fuzzy around the edges, if if that makes any sense. It, it's like she isn't even there sometimes, but but away off somewhere in, in, in time or space. A little batty, is that what you're implying? No, no, not really. She could be as sharp as a tack when she wanted to. But something about her. Well, I was scared of her, Mr. Dollar. And I don't actually know why. I see. My father and I could never be alone. Somehow she always managed to be there, separating us, driving us apart. Did she ever say anything that would lead you to believe that? She didn't have to. Just being there was enough to... All right. I know what you're thinking. Father fixation. Second wife. Jealous daughter. Neurotic imagination. That's a possibility, isn't it? No. Don't you suppose I thought of that? Made allowances for it? You think I'm a fool? I, I, I don't know what to think, Miss Wells. You told Dave Elwood you believed your stepmother had murdered your father. And so far, the only reason you've given is the fact that she was around all the time. Maybe he wanted her around. Maybe that's why he married her. Of course he wanted her around. That's not what made me suspicious. Then what did? The fact that he took out life insurance, named her as beneficiary? Not at the time. I wasn't suspicious at all, Mr. Dollar. Not until... Until the night he... He died. Oh, I... I was hurt, yes, and... I felt out of place, so... Well, I moved out of the house three months ago and took an apartment off the loop. But I... I didn't have the slightest idea she might be planning to kill him. Did he carry any insurance before they were married? Some protection for you in case of... Uh... Oh, no, he... He didn't feel that it was necessary. He, he'd set up a trust fund and... And there are some bonds and so on that I suppose will come to me. I see. No. The policy was entirely her idea. Thinking back, it, it seems to me she started talking about insurance the first week after they were married. And he finally gave in. If he hadn't, I... I think he'd still be alive. Mm -hmm. Just what were the circumstances of his death? I don't know. I wasn't there. She saw to that. What do you mean? Well, he was taken ill suddenly. In the middle of the night. He wanted her to call me, but she wouldn't do it. Why not? She claimed she didn't think it was anything serious. So there was no need of it. Instead, she called the doctor. Her doctor. A few minutes after he arrived, my father died. Then they called me. After it was all over. This doctor, is he the one who has refused so far to sign a death certificate? Oh, he was going to sign it all right. Until I got there and kicked up a scene. An obvious case of acute enteritis, he called it. Then he backed down. Decided maybe he should have another opinion. I went to father's doctor. But he said there was nothing he could do. Because he hadn't been called in at the time. He's the one who suggested I come here. Why so? He said the insurance company would help me. Since they were involved, too, they'd advise me what to do. Well, uh, what did he think about that diagnosis, acute enteritis? He said, he said it was possible, but extremely doubtful. He knew father's physical condition. He'd treated him for years. Mm -hmm. How long had your father known this Mabel Burke before they were married? Less than a month. He'd answered a Lonely Hearts ad in the paper. So I found out later by accident. Oh, I see. They both seemed embarrassed by the way they'd met. Was it a private ad or an organization? A club of some sort. The Rendezvous Club. They have an office on Atlantic Avenue. Mr. Dollar, it's not just imagination. Father's own doctor feels there's something wrong, too. 
That's why he sent me here. I'm not crazy. Easy now, easy. She killed him for his insurance. I know she did. Maybe, maybe. But there's not much to go on. Not at the moment, anyway. Think it's about time for a coffee break? Yeah, I imagine it's a little past time for Miss Wells. I couldn't. Really, I... Oh, yes, you could. Yes, you could. Go ahead now. Dig in. I'll be back in a few minutes. Have a word with you, Dave? Right, Johnny. Well, what do you think? I think it needs some looking into. How soon can you get Miss Wells and me on a plane for Chicago? Hour and a half. I've already checked. Good. I'll have her get a court order for an autopsy in case the coroner hasn't already asked for one. And we'll take it from there. Then you think the girl is telling the truth? I wouldn't bet on it. Expense account item two, $96.40. Transportation from Hartford and taxi tips and incidentals in Chicago. I dropped Norma Wells at her apartment, checked in at a hotel, and phoned the coroner's office. I learned that an autopsy request had been filed, but was being delayed pending a court order. I informed them that the daughter was available and willing now to cooperate with them. I left my name and asked the office to keep in touch with me. Item three, two dollars and ten cents. Taxi to the offices of the Rendezvous Club. Introductions arranged, mail forwarded, lonely hearts mended, and possibly murders planned. Well, hello. I must be in the wrong place. What do you mean? I mean, I, I can't see you as the lonely type. Oh, I'm not. I mean, I'm not a client. I work here. Really? For some reason, I'd always had the idea that these clubs were run by sweet old ladies of 75 or so. Oh, well, I don't exactly run it. Or at least I don't own it, if that's what you mean. Hey, you're not a client, for gosh sake. Any rules against it? Well, no. Well, how do I go about it? I mean, becoming a client. Well, you either write in or come in like you are now. Then you fill out a form, tell all about yourself, and attach a photograph. Mm-hmm. And... Look, Buster, there's no use trying to kid you. Huh? We don't have a woman in our files under 45 years old. Well, maybe I got a mother complex. What? So I uh, fill out a form. Uh, what do you do with it then? Well, we'll keep it on file. Then we send out bulletins to the active members and forward letters back and forth. Or you can come in here and be introduced. And... Look, are you serious? Don't I act serious? Well, I don't get it. A young guy with your looks and... I bet you're selling something. No, no. As a matter of fact, I uh, just got in town and I'm trying to locate a certain fellow. I I was told he's a member of your club. Oh, well, why didn't you say so? What's his name? Jonathan Wells. He probably got his address. Jonathan Wells? Yeah. Have you got a file on him? Who are you? You're with the police. Police? Now, what gives you that idea? Well, I don't know anything about the man you're looking for. No? Well, uh, suppose we check through the files. It's not here. We don't keep the files here. Where do you keep them? They're not here. Well, uh, maybe they're in the next office. Through that door there. No, you can't go in there. Relax now. Take it easy. You have no right in there. I won't let you. Oh, oh. You, know. oh you stop now it. Now, you just stand right up there on that desk and stay out of trouble. Let me down. Who do you think you are, anyhow? You get out of here. You go get a warrant if you want to. Who was in here? Nobody. Do you smoke cigars? Of course I don't smoke yeah, cigars. Yeah, right there in the ashtray, still burning. Somebody just sneaked out through that door in the hall. Who was he? What's your name? Tetler. Fanny Tetler. How long have you worked here? A year. Hey, I've got a hunch you're not a policeman. I didn't say I was. What about Wells? Have you got a file on him? No. What happened to it? I don't know what you're talking about. How about about Mabel Burke? Mabel Burke? Have you got a file on her? Of course not. What do you mean, of course not? She and Wells met through this club. Look, Buster, Mabel Burke owns this club. Johnny Duller. This is Max Lancer, Mr. Duller, DA's office. Oh? The coroner tells me you're cutting yourself in on this Jonathan Wells thing. I'm representing the insurance company. Wells carried a $50,000 policy payable to his widow. Yeah, so I hear. What about the autopsy? Any results? Not yet. The coroner's still working on it. I understand it was Wells' daughter who called you fellas in on this case. Yes, on the advice of her family doctor. I know, I talked to him. Only his version puts a different slant on things. What do you mean? He thought she was suffering from temporary hysteria. He was only trying to calm her. He 
didn't think she'd really fly back to Hartford and stir up a mess like this. I see. Her father's sudden death must have been quite a shock to her. It may have caused her to uh, imagine things. Things like murder? Maybe. It's a possible way. What do you think? I think I'll wait for the results of that autopsy, Mr. Lancer. I'll keep in touch. <laughs> From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office, Northwestern Surety Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, The Lonely Hearts Matter. Location, Chicago, Illinois. Expense account continued. Item six, $2.10 for a late lunch at my hotel. I finished it, went up to my room, and started trying to fit the few facts I had into some kind of a pattern that made sense. Max Lancer at the DA's office might be right. Maybe it was nothing more than just hysterical suspicion. And she'd admitted herself that she was hurt and jealous when he married Mabel Burke. Sudden death could still be natural death. And yet, all I could do at the moment was wait for the results of that autopsy. Yeah? Mr. Dollar. Mm, Who is it? It's me, Norma Wells. Oh, all right. Just a minute. Come in. Come in, Miss Wells. Thank you. What's wrong? I'm scared. Of what? I don't know exactly. Oh? Well, here. Here. Come on over here and sit down. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Oh, what do you mean you don't know exactly? Could I be, be losing my mind, Mr. Dollar? <laughs> if you were, you'd be the last one to think so. Now tell me what's happened. Well, I, I went to the coroner's office to sign the authorization for the autopsy and then went back to my apartment. A little while later, the phone rang, and when I answered it, there was nobody on the line. Wrong number, maybe. No. I mean, I mean, there was somebody on the line, but they didn't say anything. I kept saying hello, and then there was a click, and the line went dead. And that's all that happened? No. Short time afterward, I, I heard footsteps out in the hall. They stopped at my door, and I kept waiting for someone to ring the bell. When they didn't, I... I finally got up enough courage to open the door. There's nobody there. I see. A few minutes after that, the phone rang again. The same thing as before. I couldn't stay there any longer. I ran out and got a taxi and came here. Well, who do you think might be doing a thing like that, Miss Wells? I don't know. But somebody is. I'm not just imagining things. Max Lancer, the DA's investigator, seems to think you might be. I know. He talked to me at the coroner's office. That's why I came to you, Mr. Dollar. You've got to help me, please. Be glad to, but how? There must be something you can do. Yeah, yeah. I can wait for that autopsy report. And at the moment, that's about all I can do. Without some definite evidence of a crime, something stronger than mere suspicion, we don't have a leg to stand on. But but suppose the report doesn't show anything. Then I wipe the egg off my face and go back to Hartford. But but look, maybe she was... She was clever enough to kill my father in some way that wouldn't show up in an autopsy. Such as? I don't know. But I do know, as sure as I'm sitting here, that she married him and got him to take out that insurance policy with the full intention of murdering him. Well, such things have been known, all right. Somebody using a correspondence club to contact wealthy pigeons. Did you know that your stepmother owns that Lonely Hearts Club? Owns it? That's what the girl in charge told me. A Fanny Tetler. Do you know her? No. I've never heard of her. Neither Mabel nor my father ever mentioned that she owned the place. She apparently has somebody running it for her. A man, I think. Any idea who he might be? No. He slipped out before I got a chance to see him. Smoked cigars. He left one burning in the ashtray. Wait. Maybe it's Burton. Burton? Burton Creeley, her nephew. He smokes cigars. Well, that's the first I've heard of him. He's detestable. He moved in on us right after Mabel and my father were married. He's the main reason why I left the house. I couldn't stand him. He was always after me, bothering me. Is he still living there? Yes, sir. Was he in the house the night your father died? Yes. At least he was when I got there. That was an hour afterward, as I told you. Does he have a job, work anywhere? I don't think he's ever worked. He lives off of her. Uh He and your father get along all right? My father could get along with anyone. 
He always managed to see the best in people. And then Burton was careful to, to act different around him. I see. I suppose you think that's some more of my imagination. And frankly, Miss Wells, I don't know what to think. If there was only some way to prove what I'm sure of. Well, let's wait for that autopsy report. In the meantime, I think I'll go out and talk to your stepmother. What about me? Stay right where you are. Don't go out of this room. When I get back, we'll pick up some things from your apartment, and you can check in here at this hotel for a few days. <laughs> Expense account item seven, taxi to Lakeshore Drive and the beachfront residence of the late Jonathan Wells. I was beginning to feel more and more like a fool. It looked as though Max Lancer might be right. Apparently, a jealous, hysterical girl had lost her head and stirred up a nasty mess, all without one single fact to back up her suspicions. I had a hunch the autopsy report was going to show death from natural causes. For two cents, I'd have thrown the case over. In fact, I didn't even see where I had a case. Good afternoon, young man. How are you? How do you do? Are you Mrs. Wells? Yes, that's right. Is there something I can do for you? My name is Dollar, Johnny Dollar. I'm representing the company that holds the insurance policy on your late husband's life. Oh, well, you must be mistaken. Mr. Morningby represents that company. That Mr. Matthew R. Morningby. Uh, Mr. Morningby is the local agent. I'm from the home office in Hartford, Connecticut. Oh, I see. Yes, I have my credentials right here if you'd like to see. Oh, no, 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 that is not necessary. I always judge people by their faces. And you have an honest face, Mr. Dollar. Thank you. I wonder if I could ask you a few questions, Mrs. Wells. Well, I suppose so. I know this must be painful for you, and I'll try to be as brief as possible. Oh, well, now, don't you worry about me. I'm all right. Of course, I miss Jonathan and all that. He was a terribly nice man, terribly. But I think of death as just being the doorway to a greater and more glorious life. Well, that's one way of looking at it. You just come right in, young man, and ask all the questions you're a mind to. Thank you. You come right in here, and we'll sit down and have a nice chat. Now, oh, this is a very attractive house, Mrs. Wells. Oh, yes, yes, I think so, too. Jonathan built it years ago. He and his first wife lived here, you know. Of course, I've changed the drapes and things. Uh, just some of the little things sit right down there now. Thank you. And his daughter, too. Uh, she lived here the first month we were married, and then she moved into town. A strange little thing, really. Sort of uh, nervous and irritable. I've met her, Mrs. Wells. Oh, well, then you know what she's like. Oh, it's too bad, too. Would you like some tea and cookies, Mr. Dollar? No, thanks. That's one thing Jonathan wouldn't miss for the world. His tea and cookies at four o'clock every afternoon. Every afternoon. Oh. The house just doesn't seem the same without him. No, I imagine it doesn't. That's how I won his heart, you know. With my cookies and cakes. Mm -hmm. Oh, he really did adore them. And it was such a pleasure. Baking things for a person who appreciated them so much. Yes. It makes you feel lonesome and lost not having anybody to cook for. Do you ever feel lonesome, Mr. Dollar? Well, I guess everybody does it, too. Why, I... at the time I met Jonathan, I was feeling so lonesome I could just cry. Mr. Burke had died two years before. Mr. You know. Burke? Yes, he was my husband before Jonathan. That was in St. Louis, of course. I oh, see. He was a fine man. Walter Mabley Burke. Tall and handsome and impressive. Just like his name sounds. And a perfect picture of health. Right up to the day he died. His death was sudden? Unexpected? Oh, yes. A complete surprise. Acute indigestion, the doctor called it. Mm. Of course, I don't think he was quite as thoughtful as Jonathan. Jonathan was always so considerate. And he, he was a... Oh, my gracious, here I go, just rambling on and on. You didn't come here to listen to my silly little affairs. No, 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 they're very interesting. Well, I've always tried to keep busy and keep my mind occupied. That's why I started in business. The Lonely Hearts Club. Oh, well, you've heard about it. Well, I admit, I felt kind of foolish at first about starting it. I mean, you know, about Josh, about those kind of clubs. It was Burton's idea, really. He's my nephew, you know. Oh, here, I wish he were here this afternoon so you could meet him. So do I. He's such a nice boy. He thought I'd do real well at that kind of business. And he was right, too. Absolutely right. Oh, no, money, you understand. But it was loads of fun meeting all those nice people. Especially men, yes. I see. That's how I met Jonathan. So I was told. That's the way it happened. He wrote into the club, and I sent him my picture, and that's what started it. I remember when Burton showed me the letter, he said, Aunt Mabel, this one sounds like your kind of man. And he certainly was, too. Uh, does Burton help you with the club? Oh, well, he runs it, really. 
He's such a sweet boy, and he works so hard. I just don't know what I'd do without Burton. I don't know what I'd do. Yes, I imagine he's a great comfort to oh, you. Oh, you have no idea, Mr. Dark. I suppose not. Well, I guess I'd better run along, Mrs. Wells. It's been such a pleasure talking with you. It seems like young folks nowadays don't often have the gift of conversation the way they did in my time. Well, things move faster today. Well, I certainly hope that company of yours moves fast, young man. Well... I have to start house hunting, you know. The estate and everything goes to Jonathan's daughter, and all I have is the insurance. Yes. Oh, it's such a bother, Mr. Dollar, the funeral and moving and all the details. Seems like I just have the worst luck with my husband's. I walked out of there groggy, my head spinning. No wonder Norma Wells was nervous and hysterical. I felt that way myself after only a few minutes of it. And I still had no case, not one piece of evidence. I'd had a pleasant chat with a sweet old lady, a little on the dotty side, maybe, but that was all. Dead end. Max Lancer from the DA's office was waiting for me in the hotel lobby. You will notice I'm holding my hat in my hand, Mr. Dowling. How come? It's a symbol of humility. You were right all along. According to the coroner's report, Jonathan Wells died from a dose of ground glass. So it's murder after all. And in that case, do something for me, will you? From now on, I'm your man. Contact the authorities in St. Louis and have them check into a death that happened there about two and a half years ago. A man named Walter Maberly Burke. Who's he? Mrs. Wells was married to him at the time. Uh-oh. Another murder? No, just a matter of bad luck. She told me so herself. Here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a strange attack, a scared girl, a hunt in the dark, and 13 knots make a noose. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. Welcome back. Well, even if the widow is not guilty, she may get herself into trouble volunteering way too much information that could be prejudicial against her to an insurance investigator. Overall, a solid uh, start. You know, a lot of questions. Johnny really showing some care for the daughter and making sure that she c takes care of herself and is safe, even while not being entirely sure of the claim. We will have to see how this uh, works out on Friday. Well, listener comments and feedback now, and we start with uh, a letter from John. 
John writes, Adam, I listen frequently to the Great Detective episodes. Podcasts allow me to fit them into my schedule. Here are a couple of photos of Burlington. You said you were through here once. A couple interesting sites, but basically an old Mississippi River town. Lots of aging infrastructure. Now the new Viking Mississippi boat is also making stops along with the Queens. And here I think John is referring to river cruises. Now, uh, John had actually emailed me before, just kind of an informational email, and he, when he mentioned he was from Iowa, I asked if he listened on a radio station that's actually replaying the podcast out there, KWQQ. If you are listening on KWQQ, hello, but... As John said, he was a podcast listener, and he mentioned he was uh, from Burlington. And I remember going through Burlington. We went uh, through there in 1996. And one of the uh, uh, postcards he sent along is of this uh, bridge. And I do remember driving across it. It's a quite impressive bridge. And the photographer just got a beautiful picture of it. And he also uh, sent along this picture of, which is this really interesting curving road. I did go ahead and post both pictures uh, over on Instagram, and you can check those out over there at Instagram.com slash Great Detectives. But thank you, John, so much for your support, as well as for the letter and the pictures. It was really nice to see those. And then we have some comments on the Lair Douglas Douglas of Hitherscope Manor. Emmett writes, As soon as I heard the first few minutes, I knew it was a Jack Johnstone script. Few writers, with the possible exception of Blake Edwards, are as easy to spot just from the f- a few lines of dialogues. As John Dixon Carr was to suspense, John Stone was to Johnny Dollar. Well, thanks for the comment, Emma. And I definitely agree that John Stone's writing stands out, particularly from the other writers in the serial era. Plus, once you've listened to the self-contained episodes, the majority of which were written by John Stone, you'll probably see those patterns even more. And then uh, Doc emails in, and he writes, Often I've heard the term dog used to refer to a performance or event that was subpar. However, my wife and I rescue Siberian Huskies, and we believe most dogs are fantastic animals. So I won't s- insult canines by calling the Lear Douglas Douglas etc. ad nauseum matter a dog because it was anything but a fantastic creature. From the ridiculous overreaction of the insurance company executive to the outrageous accent of the dog owner, I can't imagine a more pitiful attempt by the writer to create a script for Johnny Dollar. I have to wonder how difficult it was for the actors to get the timing right for the opening scene when each one was uh, talking over the other while a Scottish terror was chewing up Johnny's pants legs. There is so much more I could write about the five-part episode, but I don't believe the Laird, or is that Lord matter, (laughs) is worth the effort. Please understand that I truly enjoy almost all Johnny Dollar episodes. I've listened to all of those you have broadcast at least once. I've heard most of them two or three times. This series is amazing. Unlike... Some listeners, I especially enjoy the five-parters since it allows the writers more time to develop the characters and plot. I suppose uh, that is what makes this dog, in quotation marks, smells like a two-week-old red herring. Please uh, never stop what you are doing. Well, thank you so much, Doc. George uh, reacts to the first two episodes. He writes, I just... Couldn't keep from commenting on the first two chapters of this program. This has to be one of the most poorly written Johnny Dollar episodes ever, at least for the beginning. The entire first episode was painful to uh, listen to, from the overly long juvenile silliness in the elevator to an insurance agent that makes characters usually played by Howard McNear seem like college professors, and the stereotypical clueless rich old lady with the too-long name uh, even more annoying than Mrs. Howell on Gilligan's Island. 
All to tell us nothing, most of the second episode was again consumed with rehashing the first, with the point of the whole thing barely making it uh, by the end. Not intriguing, as the announcer said, just awful. I sure hope the remaining parts are better. Well, thanks so much, George. I appreciate the emails and the criticisms of the episode, and I think they're fair enough. I think there's some valid points in there, and also there's just a fact of different people tend to have issues with different episodes. It really is fascinating. I, I used to or read through IMDb reviews of Columbo's episodes, and you would just see, you know, with generally every episode, there is this range of thought from this is the best thing ever in the history of Columbo to this was the most horrible thing ever done. And there can be good arguments. For my part, I tend to view the Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscope Matter as one of the lesser serials, but not the one that I personally dislike. That's coming up, and uh, doubtless it'll be a different one than what some of you don't like. Often a little more tolerant of silliness, and certainly the first episode had that. I think the story does have a very clever conceit at its core. The idea that this somewhat sweet, dotty, eccentric, old wealthy woman is actually a cold-blooded Machiavellian killer driven by greed and social position is a big flip in expectations, and I have to respect the sort of audacity to turn our expectations on their head. And more than that, I think that the actors did a good job of selling it. Bob Bailey handles comedic material really well. I do like Harry Bartell as Harry Branson. And while the segment in the elevator took a little bit long, I think that it's it was fine. And then, of course, Jeanette Nolan really was convincing as both versions of the character. So I wouldn't put this as the worst Johnny Dollar serial. It certainly doesn't make my top five. And honestly, it may not even make my top 50. Though I've never ranked all 58. I think that's an exercise that would require a massive amount of work and no one would much want to see, not even me. But I still think there's enough redeeming qualities that I found it overall entertaining. But again, your mileage may vary. In other comments, we had some more comments over on YouTube regarding indictment. Sheila writes regarding the episode Bitter Greats. Another great story. I hope there will be more episodes. Another listener writes, This was a good one. I do miss Tales of the Texas Rangers, though. You should think about uh, doing Mr. District Attorney. That's a bit more of a detective show than this. Well, thanks for the comment. I, I had looked at Mr. District Attorney a few years back, and what I found with that series is that it felt a lot more like a crime show uh, than a detective show. Now, what I mean by that is that most of the episodes I listened to, we already knew the outcome of the crime, and there wasn't even a clever inverted mystery going on. Now, of course, there are some series that we played that have had uh, episodes that felt more crime show than detective show like. Uh, mainly when I, I think of Philo Vance and Boston Blackie. Although Boston Blackie usually tended to have those as more kind of inverted mysteries where it was a question as to how catch them rather than who done it. That said, when we get into the adventure series, I will look at some of those programs that I chose not to do or great detectives because they didn't really fit with the uh, type of series that we were wanting to do. I know, for example, we are going to end up doing Counter Spy when we get into the adventure series, although we're, we're still uh, probably a year and a half off from that. All right, well, now it's time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. 
And I want to go ahead and thank Gary. Gary has been one of our Patreon supporters since August 2016, currently supporting the program at the rookie level of $2 or more per month. Thank you so much for your support, Gary. And that will do it for today. If you are enjoying this podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software. And be sure to rate and review the podcast wherever you download us from. We'll be back on Friday with the conclusion of the Lonely Hearts matter. But join us back here tomorrow for Dangerous Assignment, where... Let go of me! Just stand still, Buster. I said let go of me! Is that the same gun you were popping away at me with a minute ago? I'll take it. There. You have made a mistake, Senor Mitchell. I've made a mistake, but you know my name, huh? Don't give me that. I know your name because I have been following you. That's what I mean. But I am not one of those who shot at you a moment ago. Now, look, you expect me to believe that you didn't Mitchell, shoot... I do not feel obligated to prove what I say to you. And yet, if you will kindly place my gun under your nose and smell of it, you will see that it has not been fired recently. Huh? Well, no, it hasn't. Look, if you didn't take that shot at me, who did? Two men were following you. They ran off before I could get to this scene. Who are you, and how come you know my name? I'm Alfred Goya, chief of police. Why? Precisely. And now may I have my gun back? Why, yeah, but I still don't see why you are following me. To warn you, Senor Mitchell. I know who you are and why you are here. Oh, you want me to keep hands off, huh? You could not have stated it more clearly. I guess that sort of tips me as to which camp you're in. You are mistaken again, Senor. I am in neither camp. Then what is your angle in this deal? My angle, as you call it, is quite simple. Politics is not my business, but law enforcement is. I have the best police force in South America. At present, we are engaged in the search for a fugitive from justice. Hartley? Hartley. I do not intend to let anything or anyone interfere with that search, Senor Mitchell, and by anyone, I mean chiefly you. Well, you've made yourself pretty clear, Goya. What happens if I uh, sort of get in your way somewhere along the line? My policemen are quite zealous, Senor Mitchell, and the penalty for obstructing justice is quite severe. Need I say more? I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.